Uh, my name is Keith Sweats. I'm a palliative care physician uh, over at the Birmingham VA. Um, relatively new to the area, uh, just moving here in May, uh, and was very excited about this opportunity. Uh, as certainly, I hear a lot about the community-based practices and uh, take care of folks from from all over the area. So it's really exciting to be here and and see this beautiful campus and. Uh, see you here to, to hear about this topic, one that I'm usually very excited about giving a talk on. And I call it ethical decision making in complex illness. You could call it goals of care. You could call it how do we deal with medicine in the 21st century because things are awful complicated. Um, but it's, it's one that I certainly like to, uh, to share and certainly uh, we'll make sure there's time for feedback and thoughts uh, from your individual practices as well. So the obligatory learning objectives for your credit, we're going to discuss shared decision making and challenges to this. We're going to discuss the technological imperative and how it applies to serious illness. And we're going to talk about uh, how these, these technological advances can impact survival and quality of life and, and costs that go beyond just the cost of dollars. So just some background information to kind of frame our thinking a little bit. We know that uh, it's no surprise if you're doing general medicine or if you're doing geriatrics or family medicine or surgery or ortho that, that we're dealing with an aging America. And by 2030, we expect that one in five Americans will be greater than 65 years old. And it's not just that patients are getting older, but their care is potentially getting more complex and they're living with more advanced and life-limiting illnesses. And this also means that if they're living with these illnesses that they die across a whole host of settings, whether those are inpatient or in skilled care centers or at home. And a lot of that um, is something that can impact the quality of death and dying for many. We know that if we think even back to 20 or 30 years ago, diseases that were previously very, very fatal, uh, HIV, advanced heart failure, certain types of cancer, and these portended a very poor prognosis even in the short term, that we have much better management strategies and thinking about metastatic breast cancer potentially being a lethal disease but also one that now has many, many treatment options and, and patients can live for, for months or years with this particular illness. And they may have a, a, a big MI but folks get a, a rapid PCI and then they survive their MI so they're, they're dealing with chronic heart failure. And then maybe there's smoke accumulated lung disease and they have COPD in addition and then there's diabetes. So patients become much, much more complex having you know, a multitude of overall illnesses. And part of this is because of our, our diagnostic abilities, part of it is because of the medical abilities, and part of it is because of technology. When we look at the overall experience of patients that are in the hospital and, and those that die in the hospital, we know from, from way back to the support study, one of the first studies that really looked at end of life issues in the United States, that often patients have untreated pain or symptoms, there's low overall satisfaction, and potentially there's long hospitalizations with interventions that could be costly and maybe not improve our diagnostic abilities or improve the overall quality of life of the patients. When we think about some Dartless at Atlas data, that's a little bit on the uh, dated side now, but the numbers are, are fairly congruent, even uh, the current data. <coughs> About 98% of Medicare decedents, patients with Medicare who die, spend at least some time in the hospital in the final six months of their life before they die. And depending on what studies you look at, anywhere between 15% and somewhere over half of patients that have Medicare and die spend at least one trip to the ICU in the last six months of their life. Now, I'm a general internist by training. I still enjoy doing general medicine and hospital-based medicine. And, and I'm completely fine with people going to the ICU. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just sent someone just a, a week or two ago from our palliative care unit to the ICU. And folks might say, gosh, that's, that seems like awful uh, different extremes. But the real question becomes not about using the ICU or being in the ICU, but is the ICU giving the patient the reasonable chance of achieving what they hope to achieve? Do we have something that we can fix that's fixable? Or do we have a whole host of problems that really there's no easy solution to? And the ICU just becomes our default position because it's the easiest or it's the next thing that, that seems appropriate to do given vital signs or given overall uh, clinical deterioration. So when I think about these problems and I think about the patients that, that may require intensive cares, that may require uh, multiple uh, interventions, 
I try to frame this uh, from my perspective in, in a bioethical perspective. So I was always very interested in end of life care and, and bioethics and, and did some extra training and, 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 and got an additional master's degree in this because I was just fascinated by this concept of it's not only about looking at the difficult problems that we face in medicine and not what we can do, but what should we do? Because I think you'll all have experience with saying there's a lot that we can do. We can use ECMO, we could use CVVH, we can use uh, uh, LVADs, we can use CRT, we can use multiple different surgical techniques and, and interventional techniques. But the real question is, in a given situation, what should we do? And that's very, very hard to sometimes figure out because there's a whole bunch of competing interests. So one of the most common ways that we try to broach this, because we can't say that there's universal laws that we should always do something in every situation, kind of a very Kantian approach to things, and we can't necessarily say that we're just purely utilitarian, that ends justify means, and that we use patients as a means, that's, that's not necessarily uh, how we practice. So Beecham and Childress are, articulate these principles. And many of you probably experienced them in your shelf exams or your residency exams or your board certification exams, regardless of what your training is. And really, we put in this particular uh, diagram, we put beneficence in the center because Edmund Pellegrino very nicely articulated from a virtue-based perspective that beneficence is the central aim of medicine. So it comes back to thinking whether you went to nursing school or medical school or PA school, or, or whatever type of, of schooling you had, when you were sitting there across from the dean who was asking you about coming in and said, why do you want to be a doctor? Why do you want to be a therapist? Why do you want to be a social worker? Most people came up with some answer that says, I want to help people. I want to do good for people. And, and I really haven't met many folks that say, I want to do medicine because I want to avoid harming people in challenging situations. So we see that beneficence and doing good and non-maleficence trying to avoid harm often are, are very, very difficult to tease out. And sometimes what we as clinicians see as harmful may be very, very different than what patients are willing to accept as harmful. And that's where we have to balance it with the third principle of really looking at respect for patient autonomy. And the principle isn't autonomy by itself, it's that we as clinicians have an obligation to respect patient's autonomy. That doesn't mean we necessarily have to agree with it. That doesn't necessarily mean we have to eventually go through it. But we have to recognize that patients that have decision-making capacity have a right to try to determine their care within reasonable means. And often we have to couch this within the concept of justice. So is it very appropriate, is it very reasonable that we're thinking about spending $250,000 on the initial hospitalization for a left ventricular assist device and the subsequent care certainly can, can move up there approaching a million dollars. Is that how we look at things or do we say, gosh, that $250,000, if we had that money for all those VADs we put in, we can make sure that all of our children get vaccinated. We can make sure that everyone has a basic minimum. We can make sure that a lot of different things happen. But the truth is that justice on, on, a, on an ethical perspective is really a macro issue. It's something that we can talk about lobbying, we could talk about law, we could talk about politicians, we could talk about Obamacare, folks want to talk about that. But the truth is that doesn't necessarily impact the interaction that when you leave here and walk into Mr. Jones's room and you're faced with the challenge of providing the appropriate care to Mr. Jones, those things that, that are on a macro level don't really matter. It's an individual interaction with patients. So we may hear sometimes in the ICUs some moral distress amongst nurses and other care providers saying, gosh, why are we doing this? We shouldn't be doing this. But the truth is, if we weren't doing it, there's really not a mechanism in the US to say, I'm going to take this $500,000 that we quote unquote saved in this situation, and I'm going to redistribute this $500,000 in a way that makes more sense. What we often say is that a hospital system might lose less money Right? They might be less in the red. Or maybe in a given situation, uh, an insurance company might save some money. But really, the, the redistribution of those dollars isn't necessarily something that happens because our healthcare system isn't a vacuum. There's lots of different factors that impact the care that we provide to patients. 
And one of the challenges with this particular situation is that we could say, what is the most important principle? And yesterday I did an exercise like this with our uh, internal medicine residents and, and some of our palliative care and geriatric fellows. And three of them said three different things. One said beneficence is the most important. One said non-maleficence is the most important. One said justice, or excuse me, one said uh, autonomy and respect for it is most important. And then one kind of snide, condescending internal medicine resident said, I'm all about justice, just because he wanted to be different and, and add that. But the truth is, of those three things, it's really hard to parse out what's most important. And not only is it hard to parse out what's most important, but these, these principles are often at odds with one another. And, and we often have that very, very difficult job of what Beecham and Childress called specification, trying to say, in this situation, looking at all the facts, what's most important to looking at what's harmful to the patient, what's potentially beneficial to the patient, and overall, what, what respects their autonomy. And it's only through a process of discussion and shared decision making that we sometimes can figure out what the most important goals really are. So I, give us an example here. It's the only part of audience participation. And there are some folks here, and if I get one or two folks to just yell something out, I'll be very, very happy. But think about this, a 79-year-old Caucasian gentleman, retired farmer from the Gadsden area, He's married for 60 years, and he has that past medical history that most of our students uh, are like, gosh, I had to learn all these acronyms to figure out on the chart as we're typing our notes, so we have to abbreviate everything. But we could say it looks ridiculous, but this probably isn't that different from many of the patients that we take care of. And for this particular gentleman with his multiple medical morbidities, develops worsening renal function, and the concept of dialysis is, is, is brought up. And the real question is, is this patient's autonomy absolute? If he says, I want dialysis or I don't want dialysis. And if you could think about this case, what are some of the factors that impact this patient's medical decision making? It's the only audience participation. And I won't even look if you want me not to know. Cost. Cost. So cost to them, cost to the system, out-of-pocket costs, lots of different ways of looking at costs. Yep. Quality of life, right? We can do this, but how many times do we see folks that get dialysis that say, this absolutely improves my quality of life in my, my intradialytic interval between my sessions, I have really good quality of life. The day I have dialysis, I'm sleepy, uh, but those days in between, I could play with my grandkids, I can have really good quality of life versus I feel the same on my dialysis days versus my non-dialysis days. I don't get out of my chair. I can't do much, I get short-winded. Much different quality of life. That's different before and after you start dialysis. <laughs> the decision is, do I start dialysis? You don't know because you've never experienced Right, and, and people can say, I've seen someone who's done that and, and they've done really, really well with it. And I had a brother or neighbor who did dialysis and they did great with it. And you could say that the individual patient might say, gosh, I've known folks that, that haven't done well with it. But the real challenge, you're right, is that this particular patient's multimorbidity and frailty and, and, and other comorbidities may dictate how well they do or how well they don't do. Absolutely. So social factors, how are they going to get to dialysis? Who's going to give them the ride? He's a farmer. He's still working on the farm. How are things going to go down? Religious beliefs, spiritual beliefs, do I have to do dialysis? If I don't do dialysis, is it wrong? Is it a sin? If I do start dialysis and decide it's not for me, is that committing suicide? A lot of different patients will have a lot of different world views about this. And these are all factors that we have to think about in terms of saying, is this something that's going to potentially help the person to get what they're looking for and what they're accomplishing? So when I think about palliative care, I think about really, even for this particular situation, I think about active and total care of patients whose diseases aren't fully responsive to curative therapy. So symptom control and quality of life for patients in the family unit become very, very important. And it's about affirming life, not necessarily saying that the patients won't die, but often I try to talk to patients about, you know, what's important to you and how will this particular treatment help you to accomplish the things that's important to you. And we'll talk very specifically about that with the shared decision making a little bit later. 
And the real important concept is we're not looking at hastening death, but we also recognize that sometimes death can't be postponed. So sometimes, regardless of our very aggressive interventions, folks still will succumb to their multiple medical problems. There are limits to technology, and mortality in society is still a 100% uh, phenomenon. So really, sometimes it's about the medical team, it's about what the physician thinks, but I sometimes rely very, very strongly on my other colleagues from other dimensions of uh, spiritual ministers, either the ones at the hospital or the ones that work with the patient outside, social workers who really get a true understanding sometimes way better than I would about what some of the real challenges that patients face in the home setting, and we can go on. And really, with palliative care, I try to make sure that folks know that I'm not looking to exclude certain therapies. And that gets back to the point about the ICU. The ICU may be very, very appropriate for a given patient. We're not saying that if someone is on palliative care that they shouldn't go to the ICU. The real question becomes, how will their trip to the ICU potentially impact their overall quality of life, their survival, or the things that are important to them? And you could plug in, how will chemotherapy help? How will dialysis help? How will a pacemaker help? How will a defibrillator help? And really, there are situations when those therapies may be very, very appropriate. And, and what I tell patients often is that the goals of care or the goals of treatment is something that really has to be iteratively discussed because what one person experiences at a given time may change over time, and we actually expect that it will. How someone's doing with their initial defibrillator placement for primary prevention is very different than they may be doing when they've now been diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. The goals of therapy change and need to be reassessed in that particular situation. So I really try to think about a whole sphere of care. And I think it's really important to think about that what we're doing here is really not just focusing on end of life palliative care really isn't just about stopping therapies and focusing on comfort care. For some patients, that absolutely is appropriate in the setting of massive stroke or, or other care where uh, comfort care is gonna be the focus. But often it's really about this quality of life, ascertainment and, and, and continual reassessment. Now, one of the challenges when we think about quality of life and when we think about survival is there are lots of different depictions of how folks may experience their overall end of life. And at least the majority of patients I see, it's not that different in Alabama than it was in Minnesota, um, where I practiced previously, but the majority of people think that their death is gonna be the upper left-hand corner. That I'm gonna keep going on and keep going on and I'm gonna die. And that's it, I'm gonna die in my sleep. And I think, what we all know is that we probably much more commonly see two, three, and four as our options, where someone does fairly well and then develops a terminal illness with a predictable outcome that continues to have a decline over time. And we could think about uh, uh, patients with malignancy or ALS in this particular situation. We could think about the organ failure, where we have folks with end-stage liver or end-stage heart disease that continue to have exacerbations, decompensated periods, they get better, but they don't necessarily always get back to the previous place that they were. And one of the real challenges about those patients is it's really hard to determine, is this dip the final dip? Because when you have folks that come in with end-stage COPD and continue to have exacerbations, and you're trying to talk to them about, will the ventilator help or will non-invasive help? Often what the, the feedback I'll get is, well, it helped last time, so of course I want that. I got off the ventilator when I got pneumonia a year ago, so why would I want to go on the ventilator now? And understanding where they are in that disease trajectory can be very challenging. And then the concept of frailty really is something that, you know, we could think about frailty, we could think about dementia as well, and stages of dementia, where quality of life may, and functional status may be low to begin with, but there is a precipitous and ongoing decline. Uh, but again, really, really hard to determine when folks come in this situation, is this their final event or will there be some improvement or will there be a new baseline established? For heart failure, Larry Allen and colleagues had this really, really nice paper and I made sure that there's a couple of references to this in the handout because I think it's a really, really, in my mind, just a brilliant, long paper, uh, but really brilliant to say 
you know, there are very different times in a clinical disease state where we may have the initial onset of heart failure because of an ischemic event, where there may be improvement with medications or resynchronization. If someone gets uh, an ICD or doesn't, they may have a sudden death or not. And they may go on for a period of time with very manageable heart failure before we really start to see recurrent decomp uh, de uh, uh, decompensations. And really it's in that, uh, that shaded oval that we really have to think about transition points when the oral medicines we're using aren't working as well, when there's recurrent hospitalizations. And for some patients, the use of mechanical circulatory support, the, the looking for a transplant, uh, the look of other invasive devices may be very, very appropriate. And for some patients, um, palliative inotropes might be something uh, that could be considered, even though the risk is of, of higher mortality, symptomatically patients might feel better. Or they may look for a, a, a purely comfort-directed strategy that, that may or may not involve hospice in a given situation. I like this particular model because it talks about the integration of palliative care and you could say curative or, or I particularly like if it would say curative or disease targeted therapy. Again, sometimes for uh, advanced liver disease, advanced COPD, advanced heart failure, we don't necessarily have curative things, but we definitely do have medicines that can help with control and overall quality of life. And what I like about this is it really shows that all of us in the healthcare profession are doing some palliative care, whether you're a surgeon, uh, whether you're an internist, whether you're a geriatrician or a family physician, uh, whether you're a non-physician, we're all doing things that try to improve quality of life. So even adjusting a diuretic dose in some, some realms is a palliative measure because it seeks to improve quality of life but we may have less uh, disease-targeted therapy as time evolves, and it's really at that time where we have to think about how do we ramp up the efforts that focus on a person's quality of life and overall well-being. So I mentioned this Larry Allen paper, which again I think is very, very helpful for looking at heart failure. This is another really, really excellent reference. Uh, Woody Moss and colleagues uh, through the Renal Physicians Association have this guideline for shared decision making with initiation of dialysis. And again, it's, it really tries to get us away from a situation of, well, you have two choices. You can do dialysis or you can die. What do you want to do? Right? You could get a that or you can die. What do you want to do? You could get a cabbage or you can die. And it's really not about these extremes because most of us would say there are a lot of things in between the very extremes. That there's very few people that we put absolutely on comfort care and start a morphine drip and there's very, very few people that we absolutely take for the most invasive surgical intervention possible. But sometimes there's a lot of saying, what is the right thing to do in this situation? How will these therapies help you? What is the concept of a time-limited trial, which is very nicely outlined in this particular clinical guideline saying, that again, sometimes the only way we really know how well you're going to tolerate dialysis and if you're going to feel better is to try it. And signing up for it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do it forever. If we're not seeing certain tangible goals, if we're not seeing certain quality of life measures being met, if we're seeing more harm come from it than benefit, that's something that can be reassessed over time. But we do have technology, and we do have a lot of really, really good technology out there that absolutely has impacted survival and for many quality of life. We can think about the LVAD, uh, and I've been particularly interested in this because again, we used to use it just for a bridge to transplantation, but now we're saying, gosh, we have a, a person who's older, who, who's not gonna ever be eligible for a transplant, but this might give them an improved survival. And the data with an LVAD shows that if you get an LVAD for destination therapy, your two-year survival with advanced class four heart failure is about 70%. And looking at some old data, saying, gosh, if we just did our best medical management and didn't put an LVAD in, our two-year survival with class four stage D heart failure is probably about 15 to 20%. So clearly there's a big difference in survival. We could think about that for the defibrillator too, in terms of, gosh, we know that for uh, folks that are, are getting these for primary prevention, that there's data su to suggest that we can make people potentially live longer if we put them in the appropriately selected patients. And certainly, I mentioned dialysis already, but again, a lot of folks can go and have dialysis for a long period of time. 
I kind of experienced a little bit of the extremes in the past week or so where we saw one person who started the therapy and didn't tolerate it all that well and they started it in the ICU and unfortunately we know from, from data from my, my uh, previous colleagues at Mayo that starting dialysis in the ICU certainly is associated with the worse outcome than started in the even general care area than started planned in the outpatient area with the fistula on, on under controlled circumstances. But there was a gentleman who for three years did very, very well with dialysis and developed a, a hepatic cancer. And despite his cancer, he was a veteran, so he wanted to continue to undergo uh, dialysis while he um, had his liver uh, disease followed and did very well for about six months with his liver failure until he just couldn't be dialyzed anymore because of just global weakness. And I could think of another example of a, a lady that I saw yesterday, an EF of 13%. Um, really bad liver disease, refractory ascites, and her access is actually through her thigh, which I found brilliant. I've seen trans lumbar access and, and some interesting access, but um, the, the, she actually has a, a, an access through her thigh, and she's been dialyzing for 11 years, which is pretty remarkable. But it also makes it really hard for me to say, you know, your EF is 13% and your liver is getting worse, and I think this is calciphylaxis on your right thigh, and all of this tells me that things aren't going very well. It's very hard when things have been going with ups and downs for 11 years. Why are things different now? And that sometimes can be very challenging for us. So this is one way that I, I really think I really like this particular figure out of the Allen paper, and I really try uh, to use it uh, to drive home points with learners and, and with patients and, and families alike. And I think it really comes down to what our goal in medicine is. If we go back to Pellegrino's central aim, we want to take good care of patients who are at the center of our care. So the outcomes that are relevant to that patient really remain central to what we do. And when we could think about the therapies that we have, we can certainly think about the impact on survival, that many folks will live longer if we do a given therapy. So if we start dialysis, if we put a VAT in, if we take them for the potential high-risk aortic valve surgery, they may absolutely live longer, and that might be the most important goal to them. For some, it's really about quality of life being a, a central goal, and that includes not only the physical symptoms, but the emotional, psychological, spiritual, existential, social aspects that make persons who they are. And really, the, it's the richness of that narrative of who makes them, uh, what, what makes them who they are that really makes it important to understand what quality of life looks like for them. And then we talked a little bit about costs and burdens before, and, and, and I agree that there certainly always are the direct medical costs of things. But there's always the indirect costs. There's always the lost opportunities, the not being able to be on the farm, the I need to go to X medical center for an evaluation every so many months, and I don't have relatives there, and I need to get a hotel, and I need to pay for my meals when I'm there, and none of that's covered by the insurance. Or, gosh, my VAD was covered very well by dialysis, and I have it in now, but what about the sterile dressing changes? What about the folks who have to do those sterile dressing changes to prevent ongoing infection, which can be absolutely life-threatening? And what about the caregivers? What about the caregivers who, who want to do what's best for their loved one, who want to be supportive, but really, in many, many situations, the evidence would show have no idea what they're getting into? And you can have someone meet with, with a family that has a left ventricular assist device. You could have someone meet with this as a person and family and how they're dealing with dialysis or a, a surgical transplant intervention. But those are only examples that may not live up to the lived reality of what that family and what that caregiver are going to expect. So it can be a very, very challenging situation to really understand what cost actually means. It's not just the dollars. And the nice thing about this particular graph is, and I'm sure you could think about patients you saw this morning or patients you have to see this afternoon, as beautifully concentric as, as the authors of this paper have put this and put the patient at the center, I have never met a patient to this day that prioritizes each of those three domains equally. 
So think about that for a second. There are the folks that come in and say, I don't care if I'm in a nursing home, I don't care if I can't speak, I don't care if I have a feeding tube, as long as I'm alive, life is sacred at all costs, that's okay for me. There are the folks that come in and say, you know, I'm okay with God. I know where I'm at. I know what a reward awaits me. I'd like to live for certain things, but I know that, you know, I have a situation that's not curable. How can you help me to live the best I can as long as I can? And how can I not be a burden to my family? So sometimes you see a really, really big survival circle and a very, very tiny quality of life or cost circle. Sometimes you hear the folks say, I really don't want to be a burden to my family. You know, I really want to be independent, and if I can't be independent, I might not want these very, very aggressive treatments, or at least want them long term. So my takeaway is, well, how do we know about this for individual patients? How do we know what's important to them? And this is the hard but also the rewarding part. So we have to ask. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that takes time, and sometimes that takes effort, and sometimes that takes, um, you know, being late for the next patient. And sometimes that's one of those decisions that we need to make sure we have it right before we go and do a surgical intervention. Sometimes it's, I understand that this is where you're at with these three domains right now, but we need to reassess and make sure that the therapies keep, keeps consistent with that. But it's only in asking and having that, that discussion about what a person's goals, preferences, and values are. What's important to them? And thinking about how we can make recommendations for the, the care plan to help meet those goals, preferences, and values. Part of this often goes beyond this concept of, you know, what's the code status? And I was great to see some short white coats here. Um, it doesn't matter what your short white coat represents. I'm just glad that you're here. And for me, you know, we'll often hear, you know, what's your code status? If your heart stops, do you want us to do everything? You know, we're admitting tons of patients and it's really we got to get that code status in there. We got to get, do you have an advanced directive? If not, do you want information? <coughs> but a person's code status often only gives us a very slight glimpse into what their goals and values are. Because the person may say, if my heart stops or I stop breathing, I do not want an emergency call where I would have my heart shocked or be put on a breathing machine but I'm absolutely okay with other advanced measures like a PEG or going on BiPAP or dialysis or, or trach or blood products or pressors or antibiotics or chemotherapy and it could go on and on. And we really wanna steer people away from giving patients a menu. Like that's not a good situation where they say, you know, I don't wanna be on the breathing machine but you could do that heart thing one round. You're like, okay, what does that mean? You could, get, you could try it, but just do it for a couple minutes. It's like, well, no, we have to do both together, you know, circulation, airway, um, whatever the ACLS says, since I only took my BLS this time. But still, I think that, you know, what, what we'll see is, is we want to avoid the menu, but we also know that folks sometimes are very, very reluctant to say, I don't want to be resuscitated. I'm, I'm content with the do not resuscitate status because they're concerned if I say I'm a do not resuscitate status that that means I'm comfort care. That that means you're not gonna potentially give me antibiotics or IV fluids or you're not gonna transfuse me or if I need therapy and wanna do a time limit at trial that it's not something that's necessarily going to be done. So one of the things that I really encourage our health staff to think about is, is really to focus on the concept of what is your resuscitation status as being very different than what your goals of care are, okay? Because people could have predominantly palliative goals of care but still be willing to accept some invasive procedures. And sometimes they're willing to accept, I'll change my code status so that I could undergo a surgical procedure that if it might make me feel comfortable. And I think of this as a situation where, you know, you may have someone come in who who is on hospice and, and we know has an underlying you know, poor prognosis, but now has a new hip fracture. That's absolutely gonna impact their quality of life. They're gonna have pain. Uh, they're going to have limitations in mobility. Their prognosis may be months. 
And to say, oh, this is a hospice patient, they don't, we're not gonna fix them, versus, wait, what's going on? How might this impact their overall quality of life? And I can tell you, that specific hip fracture example has come up three times in the past two months for me. And I could tell you that each time it's gone differently. The one time it was the patient with very, very advanced COPD um, who couldn't move and continued to get more delirious and have difficulty with pulmonary secretions before and eventually transitioned to a comfort care without having the hip fixed because the surgical risk was just too prohibitive. I could think of the patient that came in with a relatively indolent lung cancer who had a survival probably on the order of six months but had a hip fracture and in the process of shared decision making, he said, you know, I need to do something that will allow me to be independent. It hurts too much to move. I wanna at least give it a chance. And that person went and he got through the surgery just fine. He did very, very well with his fixation. He had a gamma nail and, and began recovering and developed very, very severe hospital acquired pneumonia and died. And again, we have to look at that and say, is that anticipated mortality or not? And, and you know, where does that fit with what his goals were? He didn't want to be on machines an extended period of time, but he did want quality life. And he and his surrogates were willing to accept some risk, hoping that they could get that quality of life. And in the end, it just didn't work out that way for him. So when we think about goals of care, it's really about helping patients to understand in, in certain situations, is cure something that's reasonable or attainable? And we know that there's evidence that shows that patients with advanced lung cancer, advanced colon cancer, stage four metastatic disease, often will say, I'm going to undergo chemotherapy, I'm going to undergo radiation, and it's going to make my cancer go away. And you know they've done the study where they watched people give the information, and it's not necessarily a misperception, but there's really this, this, this uh, inherent uh, discongruence between what people understand they might get from therapy versus what's actually going to happen. If treatments are available, what are the benefits and risks of the treatment? So we think about the hip fixation, we think about chemotherapy, we think about potentially not doing chemotherapy, we think about renal replacement or not doing renal replacement therapy, or what does peritoneal dialysis look like versus hemodialysis in a given situation. If cure is not available, if we can't make this go away, are there things that we can do along any path that you choose that can help you to have good quality life? Or as I often say to patients, regardless of what you choose, doing chemotherapy or not, you know, our goal is to help you to live the best you can as long as you can. And then at the end, once it's through that, I'll come back and, and, and often say, you did notice I didn't talk about dying. It's about how do we help you to live the best you can in a given situation and know that sometimes, you know, again, death can't be staved off, but how do we help you to live the best that you can? How will treatment or non-treatment impact quality of life? I think about AML in this situation. I think about whether someone's going to get an induction chemotherapy for leukemia and do poorly with that and never leave the <laughs> hospital versus if we did some palliative transfusions or palliative hydroxyurea, what might that look like? Might they have the same relative survival, but one might allow them to be outpatient versus inpatient? And again, going back to Pellegrino, when he thinks about the moral framework for goals of care, he really comments on what is the efficacy of the therapy, what is the benefit of the therapy, and what are the burdens of the therapy? And for us as clinicians, it's really our job to think about how effective the given therapy is and how do we best communicate that to the patient and their surrogates. And the benefits and the burdens we can enumerate, but it's really within the patient's purview to say that benefit or that burden is acceptable to me or that benefit or burden is not acceptable to me in the given situation. So <clears throat> the example about dialysis given earlier, the efficacy of dialysis is very different for someone who has stage four into stage five chronic kidney disease as progressed with slowly developing uremic symptoms than the person who has acute kidney injury stage three in the ICU and has never really had underlying kidney disease, or the person who has acute kidney injury and hepatic cirrhosis, and we're thinking that it's a hepatic renal syndrome, where really the efficacy of dialysis is very, very low in that situation because those folks just tend to not do well. So I think we really have an opportunity as clinicians, and, and I would even go as far as to say an obligation 
to really try to meet patients where they're at and inform them with information that allows them to make the best decisions that they can. The other side of this is that sometimes we have to recognize that completely autonomous patients choose to not wish to discuss their prognosis. And that a patient's desire to not discuss prognosis and defer that to their loved ones or their surrogates is not uh, necessarily a, a sign of incapacity, but sometimes patients just don't want to talk about it. And meeting them where they're at is very, very important. I think autonomy still is often considered as number one, and a lot of that is because of the paternalism of the past and that pendulum to one side that swung to the ultra respect for autonomy. And really, our challenge in, in 21st century medicine is to think about how do we keep that pendulum, how do we move it back to the middle? How do we help people to make decisions? How do we make recommendations? Again, an understanding that they may disagree with that recommendation. There are plenty of times that, that I have someone with advanced malignancy or advanced end organ failure and I say, in my recommendation, um, it is unlikely that CPR is going to benefit you to the degree that you would like it to help your goals of being independent and returning home at this level of functional status. So in this situation, it's my recommendation that we do not do CPR if your heart stops or you stop breathing, but that doesn't mean that we won't do other things to help you to live the best you can as long as you can. Folks have said, that's exactly what I want. And they've gone from the, this person's a full code to, no, this person's really a DNR, they just didn't quite understand it. And I've had folks that, that I've said that to and they looked at me and said, only God decides, you don't decide. I say, that's an absolutely informed decision to say, I would like all resuscitative measures in this situation. But at least I, I feel more comfortable that, that if we help to empower people and, and not make it a black and white choice and really try to, to make our, and couch our recommendations within their goals and values, that sometimes that can be really, really helpful. And more often than not is really appreciated by, by patients and families who are looking for information to some degree.